Chapter 13 Some account of Eatonswill, of the state of parties therein, and of the election of a member to serve in Parliament for that ancient, loyal, and patriotic borough. We will frankly acknowledge that up to the period of our being first immersed in the voluminous papers of the Pickwick Club, we had never heard of Eatonswill. We will with equal candor admit that we have in vain searched for proof of the actual existence of such a place at the present day. Knowing the deep reliance to be placed on every note and statement of Mr. Pickwick's, and not presuming to set up our recollection against the recorded declarations of that great man, we have consulted every authority bearing upon the subject to which we could possibly refer. We have traced every name in Schedules A and B, without meeting with that of Eatonswill. We have minutely examined every corner of the pocket county maps issued for the benefit of society by our distinguished publishers, and the same result has attended our investigation. We are therefore led to believe that Mr. Pickwick, with that anxious desire to abstain from giving offense to any, and with those delicate feelings for which all who knew him well know he is so eminently remarkable, purposely substituted a fictitious designation for the real name of the place in which his observations were made. We are confirmed in this belief by a little circumstance, apparently slight and trivial in itself, but when considered in this point of view, not undeserving of notice. In Mr. Pickwick's notebook, we can just trace an entry of the fact that the places of himself and followers were booked by the Norwich coach, but this entry was afterwards lined through, as if for the purpose of concealing even the direction in which the borough is situated. We will not, therefore, hazard a guess upon the subject, but will at once proceed with this history, content with the materials which its characters have provided for us. It appears, then, that the Eatonswell people, like the people of many other small towns, considered themselves of the utmost and most mighty importance, and that every man in Eatonswill, conscious of the weight that attached to his example, felt himself bound to unite heart and soul with one of the two great parties that divided the town, the Blues and the Buffs. Now the Blues lost no opportunity of opposing the Buffs, and the Buffs lost no opportunity of opposing the Blues. And the consequence was that whenever the Buffs and Blues met together at public meeting, town hall, fair, or market, disputes and high words arose between them. With these dissensions, it is almost superfluous to say that everything in Eatonswill was made a party question. If the Buffs proposed to new skylight the marketplace, the Blues got at public meetings and denounced the proceeding. If the Blues proposed the erection of an additional pump in the high street, the Buffs rose as one man and stood aghast at the enormity. There were blue shops and buff shops, blue inns and buff inns. There was a blue aisle and a buff aisle in the very church itself. Of course, it was essentially and indispensably necessary that each of these powerful parties should have its chosen organ and representative. And, accordingly, there were two newspapers in the town, the Eatonswill Gazette and the Eatonswill Independent, the former advocating blue principles, and the latter conducted on grounds decidedly buff. Fine newspapers they were, such leading articles, and such spirited attacks. Our worthless contemporary, the Gazette, that disgraceful and dastardly journal, the Independent, that false and scurrilous print, the Independent, that vile and slanderous calumniator, the Gazette. These and other spirit-stirring denunciations were strewn plentifully over the columns of each, in every number, and excited feelings of the most intense delight and indignation in the bosoms of the townspeople. Mr. Pickwick, with his usual foresight and sagacity, had chosen a peculiarly desirable moment for his visit to the borough. Never was such a contest known. The Honorable Samuel Slumkey of Slumkey Hall was the blue candidate, and Horatio Fitzkin Esquire of Fitzkin Lodge near Eatonswill had been prevailed upon by his friends to stand forward on the buff interest. 
The Gazette warned the electors of Eatonswill that the eyes not only of England, but of the whole civilized world, were upon them, and the Independent imperatively demanded to know whether the constituency of Eatonswill were the grand fellows they had always taken them for, or base and servile tools, undeserving alike of the name of Englishmen and the blessings of freedom. Never had such a commotion agitated the town before. It was late in the evening when Mr. Pickwick and his companions, assisted by Sam, dismounted from the roof of the Eatonswill coach. Large blue silk flags were flying from the windows of the town arms inn, and bills were posted in every sash, intimating, in gigantic letters, that the Honorable Samuel Slumkey's committee sat there daily. A crowd of idlers were assembled in the road, looking at a horse man in the balcony, who was apparently talking himself very red in the face, in Mr. Slumkey's behalf. But the force and point of whose arguments were somewhat impaired by the perpetual beating of four large drums which Mr. Fitzkins's committee had stationed at the street corner. There was a busy little man beside him, though, who took off his hat at intervals and motioned to the people to cheer, which they regularly did most enthusiastically. And as the red-faced gentleman went on talking till he was redder in the face than ever, it seemed to answer his purpose quite as well as if anybody had heard him. The Pickwickians had no sooner dismounted than they were surrounded by a branch mob of the honest and independent, who forthwith set up three deafening cheers, which being responded to by the main body, for it's not at all necessary for a crowd to know what they are cheering about, swelled into a tremendous roar of triumph, which stopped even the red-faced man in the balcony. Hurrah! shouted the mob in conclusion. One chair more! screamed the little fugleman in the balcony, and out shouted the mob again, as if lungs were cast iron with steel works. Slum key forever! roared the honest and independent. Slum key forever! echoed Mr. Pickwick, taking off his hat. No, Fitzkin! roared the crowd. Certainly not! shouted Mr. Pickwick. Hurrah! And then there was another roaring, like that of a whole menagerie, when the elephant has rung the bell for the cold meat. Who is Slumkey? whispered Mr. Tupman. I don't know, replied Mr. Pickwick, in the same tone. Hush! Don't ask any questions. It's always best on these occasions to do what the mob do. But suppose there are two mobs, suggested Mr. Snodgrass. Shout with the largest, replied Mr. Pickwick. Volumes could not have said more. They entered the house, the crowd opening right and left to let them pass, and cheering vociferously. The first object of consideration was to secure quarters for the night. "'Can we have beds here?' inquired Mr. Pickwick, summoning the waiter. "'Don't know, sir,' replied the man. "'Afraid we'll fall, sir. I'll inquire, sir.' Away he went for that purpose, and presently returned to ask whether the gentlemen were blue. As neither Mr. Pickwick nor his companions took any vital interest in the cause of either candidate, the question was rather a difficult one to answer. In this dilemma, Mr. Pickwick bethought himself of his new friend, Mr. Perker. "'Do you know a gentleman of the name of Perker?' inquired Mr. Pickwick. "'Certainly, sir. Honorable Mr. Samuel Slumkey's agent. He is blue, I think. Oh, yes, sir.' "'Then we are blue,' said Mr. Pickwick." But observing that the man looked rather doubtful at this accommodating announcement, he gave him his card and desired him to present it to Mr. Perker forthwith, if he should happen to be in the house. The waiter retired, and reappearing almost immediately with a request that Mr. Pickwick would follow him, led the way to a large room on the first floor, where, seated at a long table covered with books and papers, was Mr. Perker. "'Ah, ah, my dear sir!' said the little man, advancing to meet him. "'Very happy to see you, my dear sir. Very. Pray, sit down. So you have carried your intention into effect. You have come down here to see an election, eh?' Mr. Pickwick replied in the affirmative. "'Spirited contest, my dear sir,' said the little man. "'I am delighted to hear it,' said Mr. Pickwick, rubbing his hands. "'I like to see sturdy patriotism on whatever side it is called forth. And so it's a spirited contest?' "'Oh, yes,' said the little man. Very much so indeed. We have opened all the public houses in the place, and left our adversary nothing but the beer shops. Masterly stroke of policy that, my dear sir, eh? And the little man smiled complacently, and took a large pinch of snuff. And what are the probabilities as to the result of the contest? inquired Mr. Pickwick. Why, doubtful, my dear sir. Rather doubtful as yet, replied the little man. 
Fitzgibbs and the people have got three and thirty voters in the lock-up coach house at the White Hart. In the coach house? said Mr. Pickwick, considerably astonished by this second stroke of policy. They keep him locked up there till they want him, resumed the little man. The effect of that is, you see, to prevent all getting at them. And even if we could, it would be of no use, for they keep them very drunk on purpose. Smart fellow, Fitzkin's agent. Very smart fellow indeed. Mr. Pickwick stared, but said nothing. We are pretty confident, though, said Mr. Perker, sinking his voice almost to a whisper. We had a little tea party here last night. Five and forty women, my dear sir, and gave every one of them a green parasol when she went away. A parasol? said Mr. Pickwick. Fact, my dear sir, fact. Five and forty green parasols at seven and sixpence apiece. All women like finery. Extraordinary the effect of those parasols. Secured all their husbands and half their brothers. Beat stockings and flannel and all that sort of thing hollow. My idea, my dear sir, entirely. Hail, rain, or sunshine, you can't walk half a dozen yards up the street without encountering half a dozen green parasols. Here the little man indulged in a convulsion of mirth, which was only checked by the entrance of a third party. This was a tall, thin man with a sandy-colored head inclined to baldness, and a face in which solemn importance was blended with a look of unfathomable profundity. He was dressed in a long brown surtout with a black cloth waistcoat and drab trousers. A double eyeglass dangled at his waistcoat, and on his head he wore a very low-crowned hat with a broad brim. The newcomer was introduced to Mr. Pickwick as Mr. Pott, the editor of the Eatonswill Gazette. After a few preliminary remarks, Mr. Pott turned around to Mr. Pickwick and said with solemnity, This contest excites great interest in the metropolis, sir. I believe it does, said Mr. Pickwick, to which I have reason to know, said Pott, looking towards Mr. Perker for corroboration, to which I have reason to know my article of last Saturday in some degree contributed. Not the least out of that, said the little man. The press is a mighty engine, sir, said Pott. Mr. Pickwick yielded his fullest assent to the proposition. But I trust, sir, said Pott, that I have never abused the enormous power I wield. I trust, sir, that I have never pointed the noble instrument which is placed in my hands against the sacred bosom of private life or the tender breast of individual reputation. I trust, sir, that I have devoted my energies to, to endeavors, humble they may be, humble I know they are, to instill those principles of which are... Here, the editor of the Eatonswill Gazette, appearing to ramble, Mr. Pickwick came to his relief and said, Certainly. And what, sir, said Pott, what, sir, let me ask you as an impartial man, is the state of the public mind in London with reference to my contest with the Independent? Greatly excited, no doubt, interposed Mr. Perker, with a look of slyness which was very likely accidental. That contest, said Pott, shall be prolonged so long as I have health and strength, and that portion of talent with which I am gifted. From that contest, sir, although it may unsettle men's minds and excite their feelings, and render them incapable for the discharge of the everyday duties of ordinary life, from that contest, sir, I will never shrink, till I have set my heel upon the Eatonswill Independent. I wish the people of London, and the people of this country to know, sir, that they may rely upon me, that I will not desert them, that I am resolved to stand by them, sir, to the last. Your conduct is most noble, sir, said Mr. Pickwick, and he grasped the hand of the magnanimous Pot. You are, sir, I perceive, a man of sense and talent, said Mr. Pot, almost breathless with the vehemence of his patriotic declaration. I am most happy, sir, to make the acquaintance of such a man. And I, said Mr. Pickwick, feel deeply honored by this expression of your opinion. Allow me, sir, to introduce you to my fellow travelers, the other corresponding members of the club I am proud to have founded. I shall be delighted, said Mr. Pott. Mr. Pickwick withdrew, and returning with his three friends, presented them in due form to the editor of the Eatonswell Gazette. Now, my dear Mr. Pott, said little Mr. Perker, the question is, what are we to do with our friends here? We can't stop in this house, I suppose, said Mr. Pickwick. Not a spare bed in the house, my dear sir. Not a single bed. Extremely awkward, said Mr. Pickwick. Very, said his fellow voyagers. I have an idea upon this subject, said Mr. Pott, which I think may be very successfully adopted. 
They have two beds at the Peacock, and I can boldly say on behalf of Mrs. Pott that she will be delighted to accommodate Mr. Pickwick and any one of his friends if the other two gentlemen and their servant do not object to shifting as they best can at the Peacock. After repeated pressings on the part of Mr. Pott, and repeated protestations on that of Mr. Pickwick, that he could not think of incommoding or troubling his amiable wife, it was decided that this was the only feasible arrangement that could be made. So it was made, and after dining together at the town arms, the friends separated, Mr. Tupman and Mr. Snodgrass repairing to the Peacock, and Mr. Pickwick and Mr. Winkle proceeding to the mansion of Mr. Pott. It having been previously arranged that they should all reassemble at the town arms in the morning and accompany the Honorable Samuel Slumkey's procession to the place of nomination. Mr. Pott's domestic circle was limited to himself and his wife. All men whom mighty genius has raised to a proud eminence in the world have usually some little weakness which appears the more conspicuous from the contrast it presents to their general character. If Mr. Pott had a weakness, it was perhaps that he was rather too submissive to the somewhat contemptuous control and sway of his wife. We do not feel justified in laying any particular stress upon the fact, because on the present occasion all Mrs. Pott's most winning ways were brought into requisition to receive the two gentlemen. My dear, said Mr. Pott, Mr. Pickwick, Mr. Pickwick of London. Mrs. Pott received Mr. Pickwick's paternal grasp of the hand with enchanting sweetness, and Mr. Winkle, who had not been announced at all, slided and bowed, unnoticed, in an obscure corner. P, my dear, said Mrs. Pott. My life, said Mr. Pott. Pray introduce the other gentleman. I beg a thousand pardons, said Mr. Pott. Permit me, Mrs. Pott. Mr. A Winkle, said Mr. Pickwick. Winkle, echoed Mr. Pott, and the ceremony of introduction was complete. We owe you many apologies, ma'am, said Mr. Pickwick, for disturbing your domestic arrangements at so short a notice. I beg you won't mention it, sir, replied the feminine pot with vivacity. It is a high treat to me, I assure you, to see any new faces, living as I do from day to day and week to week in this dull place and seeing nobody. Nobody, my dear, exclaimed Mr. Pot archly. Nobody but you, retorted Mrs. Pot with asperity. You see, Mr. Pickwick, said the host in explanation of his wife's lament, that we are in some measure cut off from many enjoyments and pleasures of which we might otherwise partake. My public station, as editor of the Edenswell Gazette, the position which that paper holds in the country, my constant immersion in the vortex of politics, P, my dear, interposed Mrs. Pott. My life, said the editor. I wish, my dear, you would endeavor to find some topic of conversation in which these gentlemen might take some rational interest. But my love said Mr. Pott, with great humility. Mr. Pickwick does take an interest in it. It's well for him if he can, said Mrs. Pott emphatically. I am wearied out of my life with your politics, and the quarrels of the independent and nonsense. I am quite astonished, P., at your making such an exhibition of your absurdity. But, my dear, said Mr. Pott. Oh, nonsense, don't talk to me, said Mrs. Pott. Do you play a cart, sir? I shall be very happy to learn, under your tuition, replied Mr. Winkle. Well, then, draw that little table into this window, and let me get out of hearing of those prosy politics. Jane, said Mr. Pott, to the servant who brought in candles, go down into the office and bring me up the file of the Gazette for 1828. I'll just read you, added the editor, turning to Mr. Pickwick, I'll just read you a few of the leaders I wrote at that time, upon the buff job of appointing a new torment to the turnpike here. I rather think they'll amuse you. I should like to hear them very much indeed, said Mr. Pickwick. Up came the file, and down sat the editor, with Mr. Pickwick at his side. We have in vain pored over the leaves of Mr. Pickwick's notebook, in the hope of meeting with a general summary of these beautiful compositions. We have every reason to believe that he was perfectly enraptured with the vigor and freshness of the style. Indeed, Mr. Winkle has recorded the fact that his eyes were closed, as if with excess of pleasure, during the whole time of their perusal. The announcement of supper put a stop both to the game at a cart and the recapitulation of the beauties of the Eatonswell Gazette. Mrs. Pott was in the highest spirits and the most agreeable humor. Mr. Winkle had already made considerable progress in her good opinion, and she did not hesitate to inform him, confidentially, that Mr. Pickwick was a delightful old dear. 
These terms convey a familiarity of expression in which few of those who were intimately acquainted with that colossal-minded man would have presumed to indulge. We have preserved them, nevertheless, as affording at once a touching and a convincing proof of the estimation in which he was held by every class of society and the ease with which he made his way to their hearts and feelings. It was a late hour of the night, long after Mr. Tupman and Mr. Snodgrass had fallen asleep in the innermost recesses of the peacock, when the two friends retired to rest. Slumber soon fell upon the senses of Mr. Winkle, but his feelings had been excited and his admiration roused, and for many hours after sleep had rendered him insensible to earthly object, the face and figure of the agreeable Mrs. Pott presented themselves again and again to his wandering imagination. The noise and bustle which ushered in the morning were sufficient to dispel from the mind of the most romantic visionary in existence any associations but those which were immediately connected with the rapidly approaching election. The beating of drums, the blowing of horns and trumpets, the shouting of men, and the tramping of horses echoed and re-echoed through the streets from the earliest dawn of day and an occasional fight between the light skirmishers of either party, at once enlivened the preparations and agreeably diversified their character. "'Well, Sam,' said Mr. Pickwick, as his valet appeared at his bedroom door, just as he was concluding his toilet. "'All alive today, I suppose?' "'Regular game, sir,' replied Mr. Weller. "'Our papers are collecting down at the town arms, and they're all in themselves also already.' "'Ah,' said Mr. Pickwick. "'Do they seem devoted to their party, Sam?' Never see such devotion in all my life, sir. Energetic, eh? said Mr. Pickwick. Uncommon, replied Sam. I never see men eat and drink so much of all. I wonder they ain't a fear to bustin. That's the mistaken kindness of the gentry here, said Mr. Pickwick. Really likely, replied Sam briefly. Fine, fresh, hearty fellows they seem, said Mr. Pickwick, glancing from the window. Well, they fresh, replied Sam. Mate, and the two waiters at the Peacock has been a pumpin' over the independent waiters as shot there last night. Pumping over the independent voters? exclaimed Mr. Pickwick. Yes, said his attendant. Every man slept very fell down. We dragged him out, and one by one this morning, and put him under the pump, and they're in regular fine order now. Shilling ahead, the committee paid for that air job. Can such things be? exclaimed the astonished Mr. Pickwick. Lord bless your heart, sir, said Sam. Why, where is you half baptized? That's nothing, that ain't. Nothing? said Mr. Pickwick. "'Nothing at all, sir,' replied his attendant. "'The night afore the last day of the last election here, "'the opposite party bribed the barmaid at the town arms "'to hocus the brandy and water of fourteen unpolled electors "'as was a stopping in the house. "'What do you mean by hocusing brandy and water?' inquired Mr. Pickwick. "'Puttin' Lord in a minute,' replied Sam. "'Blessed if she didn't send them all to sleep "'till twelve hours after the election was over. "'They took one man up to the booth in a truck, fast asleep, "'by way of experiment, but it was no go.' They wouldn't pull him, so they brought him back and put him to bed again. Strange practices, these, said Mr. Pickwick, half speaking to himself and half addressing Sam. Not half so strange as a miraculous circumstance as happened to my own father at an election time in this ready place, sir, replied Sam. What was that? inquired Mr. Pickwick. Why, he drove a coach down here once, said Sam. Election time came on, and he was engaged by one party to bring down woes from London. Night of he was going to drive up, committee on t'other side sends for him quietly. And the way he goes with the messenger, who shows him in. Large room, lots of gentlemen, apes of papers, pins and ink, and all that here. Ah, Mr. Weller, says the gentleman in the chair. Glad to see you, sir. How are you? Really well, thank you, sir, says my father. I hope you're pretty middling, says he. Pretty well, thank you, sir, says the gentleman. Sit down, Mr. Weller, pray sit down, sir. So my father sits down, and I and the gentleman looks really hard at each other. You don't remember me? says the gentleman. Can't say I do, says my father. Oh, I know you, says the gentleman. No you when you was a boy, says he. Well, I don't remember you, says my father. That's what he old, says the gentleman. Willie, says my father. You must have a bad memory, Mr. Weller, says the gentleman. Well, it is a really bad un, says my father. I thought so, says the gentleman. So then they pours him out a glass of wine, and gammons him about his driving, and gets him into a regular good humor, and at last shoves a twenty-pound note in his hand. It's a really bad road between this and London, says the gentleman. Here and there, it is a really heavy road, says my father. Especially near the canal, I think, says the gentleman. Nasty bit, that here, says my father. 
Well, Mr. Weller, said the gentleman, you are a really good whip, and can do what you like with your horses, you know. We're all really fond of you, Mr. Weller, so in case you should have an accident when you are bringing these here waters down, and should tip them over into the canal without hurting them, this is for yourself, says he. Gentlemen, you are really kind, says my father, and I'll drink your health in another glass of wine, says he. Which he did, and then buttoned up the money and bowed himself out. You wouldn't believe, sir, continued Sam, with a look of inexpressible impudence at his master, that on that witty day as he came down with him Wiltage, his coach was upset on that ere witty spot, and every man on him was turned in the canal. And got out again, inquired Mr. Pickwick hastily. Why, replied Sam very slowly, I rather think one old gentleman was missing. I know his hat was found, but I ain't quite certain whether his head was in it or not. But what I look at is the extraordinary and wonderful coincidence that out of what that gentleman said my father's coat should be upset in that willy place and on that willy day. It is, no doubt, a very extraordinary circumstance indeed, said Mr. Pickwick. But brush my hat, Sam, for I hear Mr. Winkle calling me to breakfast. With these words, Mr. Pickwick descended to the parlor, where he found breakfast laid and the family already assembled. The meal was hastily dispatched. Each of the gentlemen's hats was decorated with an enormous blue favor, made up by the fair hands of Mrs. Pott herself. And as Mr. Winkle had undertaken to escort that lady to a housetop in the immediate vicinity of the hustings, Mr. Pickwick and Mr. Pott repaired alone to the town arms from the back window of which one of Slumkey's committee was addressing six small boys and one girl, whom he dignified at every second sentence with the imposing title of Men of Eatonswill, whereat the six small boys aforesaid cheered prodigiously. The stable yard exhibited unequivocal symptoms of the glory and strength of the Eatonswill blues. There was a regular army of blue flags, some with one handle and some with two, exhibiting appropriate devices in golden characters four feet high and stout in proportion. There was a grand band of trumpets, bassoons, and drums, marshaled four abreast and earning their money, if ever men did, especially the drum beaters, who were very muscular. There were bodies of constables with blue staves, twenty committee men with blue scarves, and a mob of voters with blue cockades. There were electors on horseback and electors afoot. There was an open carriage and four for the Honorable Samuel Slumkey, and there were four carriages and pair for his friends and supporters. And the flags were rustling, and the band was playing, and the constables were swearing, and the twenty committee men were squabbling, and the mob were shouting, and the horses were backing, and the post boys perspiring, and everybody and everything, then and there assembled, was for the special use, behoof, honor, and renown of the Honorable Samuel Slumkey of Slumkey Hall, one of the candidates for the representation of the borough of Eatonswill in the Common House of Parliament of the United Kingdom. Loud and long were the cheers, and mighty was the rustling of one of the blue flags with liberty of the press inscribed thereon, when the sandy head of Mr. Pot was discerned in one of the windows by the mob beneath. And tremendous was the enthusiasm when the Honorable Samuel Slumkey himself, in top boots and a blue neckerchief, advanced and seized the hand of the said pot, and melodramatically testified, by gestures to the crowd, his ineffaceable obligations to the Eatonswill Gazette. "'Is everything ready?' said the Honorable Samuel Slumkey to Mr. Perker. "'Everything, my dear sir,' was the little man's reply. "'Nothing has been omitted, I hope,' said the Honorable Samuel Slumkey." Nothing has been left undone, my dear sir, nothing whatever. There are twenty washed men at the street door for you to shake hands with, and six children in arms that you're to pat on the head and inquire the age of. Be particular about the children, my dear sir. It has always a great effect, that sort of thing. I'll take care, said the Honorable Samuel Slumkey. And perhaps, my dear sir, said the cautious little man, perhaps if you could, I don't mean to say it's indispensable, but if you could manage to kiss one of them, it would produce a very great impression on the crowd. Wouldn't it have as good an effect if the proposer or seconder did that? said the Honorable Samuel Slumkey. Why, I'm afraid it wouldn't, replied the agent. If it were done by yourself, my dear sir, I think it would make you very popular. Very well, said the Honorable Samuel Slumkey, with a resigned air. Then it must be done, that's all. Arrange the procession, cried the twenty committeemen. 
Amidst the cheers of the assembled throng, the band and the constables and the committeemen and the voters and the horsemen and the carriages took their places, each of the two horse vehicles being closely packed with as many gentlemen as could manage to stand upright in it, and that assigned to Mr. Perker, containing Mr. Pickwick, Mr. Tupman, Mr. Snodgrass, and about half a dozen of the committee beside. There was a moment of awful suspense as the procession waited for the Honorable Samuel Slumkey to step into the carriage. Suddenly the crowd set up a great cheering. "'He has come out,' said little Mr. Perker, greatly excited, the more so as their position did not enable them to see what was going forward. Another cheer, much louder. "'He has shaken hands with the men,' cried the little agent. Another cheer, far more vehement. "'He has patted the babes on the head,' said Mr. Perker, trembling with anxiety." A roar of applause that rent the air. He has kissed one of them, exclaimed the delighted little man. A second roar. He has kissed another, gasped the excited manager. A third roar. He's kissing them all, screamed the enthusiastic little gentleman, and hailed by the deafening shouts of the multitude, the procession moved on. How or by what means it became mixed up with the other procession, and how it was ever extricated from the confusion consequent thereupon, is more than we can undertake to describe, inasmuch as Mr. Pickwick's hat was knocked over his eyes, nose, and mouth by one poke of a buff flagstaff very early in the proceedings. He describes himself as being surrounded on every side, when he could catch a glimpse of the scene, by angry and ferocious countenances, by a vast cloud of dust, and by a dense crowd of combatants. He represents himself as being forced from the carriage by some unseen power and being personally engaged in a pugilistic encounter, but with whom, or how, or why, he is wholly unable to state. He then felt himself forced up some wooden steps by the persons from behind, and on removing his hat, found himself surrounded by his friends in the very front of the left-hand side of the hustings. The right was reserved for the buff party and the center for the mayor and his officers, one of whom, the fat crier of Eaton's will, was ringing an enormous bell by way of commanding silence, while Mr. Horatio Fitzkin and the Honorable Samuel Slumkey, with their hands upon their hearts, were bowing with the utmost affability to the troubled sea of heads that inundated the open space in front, and from whence arose a storm of groans and shouts and yells and hootings that would have done honor to an earthquake. There's Winkle, said Mr. Tupman, pulling his friend by the sleeve. Where? said Mr. Pickwick, putting on his spectacles, which he had fortunately kept in his pocket hitherto. There, said Mr. Tupman, on the top of that house. And sure enough, in the leaden gutter of the tiled roof were Mr. Winkle and Mrs. Pott, comfortably seated in a couple of chairs, waving their handkerchiefs in token of recognition a compliment which Mr. Pickwick returned by kissing his hand to the lady. The proceedings had not yet commenced, and as an inactive crowd is generally disposed to be jocose, this very innocent action was sufficient to awaken their facetiousness. "'Oh, you wicked old rascal!' cried one voice. "'Looking out of the girls, are you?' "'Oh, you venerable sinner!' cried another. "'Putting on his spectacles to look at a married woman,' said a third. "'I say him a vinked at her, with his wicked old eye,' shouted a fourth. Look out of your wife, Pot, bellowed a fifth, and then there was a roar of laughter. As these taunts were accompanied with invidious comparisons between Mr. Pickwick and an aged ram, and several witticisms of the like nature, and as they moreover rather tended to convey reflections upon the honor of an innocent lady, Mr. Pickwick's indignation was excessive. But as silence was proclaimed at the moment, he contented himself by scorching the mob with a look of pity for their misguided minds, at which they laughed more boisterously than ever. Silence, roared the mayor's attendants. Wiffin, proclaim silence, said the mayor, with an air of pomp befitting his lofty station. In obedience to this command, the crier performed another concerto on the bell, whereupon a gentleman in the crowd called out, Mephange, which occasioned another laugh. Gentlemen, said the mayor, at as loud a pitch as he could possibly force his voice to, Gentlemen, brother electors of the borough of Eatonsville, we are met here today for the purpose of choosing a representative in the room of our late. Here the mayor was interrupted by a voice in the crowd. Success to the mayor, cried the voice, 
and may he never desert the nail and swordsman business as he got his money by. This allusion to the professional pursuits of the order was received with a storm of delight, which, with a bell accompaniment, rendered the remainder of his speech inaudible, with the exception of the concluding sentence, in which he thanked the meeting for the patient attention with which they had heard him throughout, an expression of gratitude which elicited another burst of mirth of about a quarter of an hour's duration. Next, a tall, thin gentleman in a very stiff white neckerchief, after being repeatedly desired by the crowd to send the boy home and ask whether he hadn't left his voice under the pillow, begged to nominate a fit and proper person to represent them in Parliament. And when he said it was Horatio Fitzkin Esquire of Fitzkin Lodge near Eatonswill, the Fiskinites applauded and the Slumkeyites groaned so long and so loudly that both he and the seconder might have sung comic songs in lieu of speaking without anybody's being a bit the wiser. The friends of Horatio Fitzkin Esquire, having had their innings, a little choleric, pink-faced man stood forward to propose another fit and proper person to represent the electors of Eatonswill in Parliament. And very swimmingly, the pink-faced gentleman would have got on if he had not been rather too choleric to entertain a sufficient perception of the fun of the crowd. But after a very few sentences of figurative eloquence, the pink-faced gentleman got from denouncing those who interrupted him in the mob to exchanging defiances with the gentleman on the hustings, whereupon arose an uproar which reduced him to the necessity of expressing his feelings by serious pantomime, which he did, and then left the stage to his seconder, who delivered a written speech of half an hour's length, and wouldn't be stopped because he had sent it all to the Eatonswell Gazette, and the Eatonswell Gazette had printed it every word. Then Horatio Fitzkin Esquire of Fitzkin Lodge near Eatonswell presented himself for the purpose of addressing the electors, which he no sooner did than the band employed by the Honorable Samuel Slumkey commenced performing with a power to which their strength in the morning was a trifle, in return for which the buff crowd belabored the heads and shoulders of the blue crowd, on which the blue crowd endeavored to dispossess themselves of their very unpleasant neighbors the buff crowd, and a scene of struggling and pushing and fighting succeeded, to which we can no more do justice than the mayor could, although he issued imperative orders to twelve constables to seize the ringleaders, who might amount in number to two hundred and fifty or thereabouts. At all these encounters, Horatio Fitzkin Esquire of Fitzkin Lodge and his friends waxed fierce and furious, until at last Horatio Fitzkin Esquire of Fitzkin Lodge begged to ask his opponent, the Honorable Samuel Slumkey of Slumkey Hall, whether that band played by his consent which questioned the Honorable Samuel Slumkey, declining to answer. Horatio Fitzkin, Esquire of Fitzkin Lodge, shook his fist in the countenance of the Honorable Samuel Slumkey of Slumkey Hall, upon which the Honorable Samuel Slumkey, his blood being up, defied Horatio Fitzkin, Esquire, to mortal combat. At this violation of all known rules and precedents of order, the mayor commanded another fantasia on the bell, and declared that he would bring before himself both Horatio Fitzkin, Esquire of Fitzkin Lodge, and the Honorable Samuel Slumkey of Slumkey Hall, and bind them over to keep the peace. Upon this terrific denunciation, the supporters of the two candidates interfered, and after the friends of each party had quarreled in pairs for three quarters of an hour, Horatio Fitzkin Esquire touched his hat to the Honorable Samuel Slumkey. The Honorable Samuel Slumkey touched his to Horatio Fitzkin Esquire. The band stopped, and the crowd were partially quieted, and Horatio Fitzkin Esquire was permitted to proceed. The speeches of the two candidates, though differing in every other respect, afforded a beautiful tribute to the merit and high worth of the electors of Eatonswill. Both expressed their opinion that a more independent, a more enlightened, a more public-spirited, a more noble-minded, a more disinterested set of men than those who had promised to vote for him never existed on earth. Each darkly hinted his suspicions that the electors and the opposite interest had certain swinish and besotted infirmities which rendered them unfit for the exercise of the important duties they were called upon to discharge. Fitzkin expressed his readiness to do anything he was wanted. Slumkey, his determination to do nothing that was asked of him. Both said that the trade, the manufacturers, the commerce, the prosperity of Eatonswill 
would ever be dearer to their hearts than any earthly object, and each had it in his power to state with the utmost confidence that he was the man who would eventually be returned. There was a show of hands. The mayor decided in favor of the Honorable Samuel Slumkey of Slumkey Hall. Horatio Fitzkin, Esquire of Fitzkin Lodge, demanded a poll, and a poll was fixed accordingly. Then a vote of thanks was moved to the mayor for his able conduct in the chair, and the mayor devoutly wishing that he had had a chair to display the able conduct in, for he had been standing during the whole proceedings, returned thanks. The processions reformed, the carriages rolled slowly through the crowd, and its members screeched and shouted after them as their feelings or caprice dictated. During the whole time of the polling, the town was in a perpetual fever of excitement. Everything was conducted on the most liberal and delightful scale. Excisable articles were remarkably cheap at all the public houses, and spring vans paraded the streets for the accommodation of voters who were seized with any temporary dizziness in the head, an epidemic which prevailed among the electors during the contest to a most alarming extent, and under the influence of which they might frequently be seen lying on the pavements in a state of utter insensibility. A small body of electors remained unpolled on the very last day. They were calculating and reflecting persons who had not yet been convinced by the arguments of either party, although they had had frequent conferences with each. One hour before the close of the poll, Mr. Perker solicited the honor of a private interview with these intelligent, these noble, these patriotic men. It was granted. His arguments were brief, but satisfactory. They went in in a body to the poll, and when they returned, the Honorable Samuel Slumkey of Slumkey Hall was returned also.